Welcome to the Nutrition and Obesity Lecture. There's a lot of slides on this one. We have a couple of activities here and there. Um, I don't know if we're going to get to everything. I know we didn't finish exercise, um, but uh, I wanted to get through this stuff and then maybe on Wednesday before we jump into the next topic, we'll finish up exercise. So I wanted to get done with as much obesity and nutrition, and, mo and, and most of this is nu nutrition because nutrition leads into obesity. Um, if you eat, you know, if you have um, issues with nutrition, then uh, you might have issues with obesity. So we're gonna to just jump into this first and then we'll, um, we'll finish exercise because I know we, uh, we needed to, um, we needed to do that. Okay, so to start us off, we are going to watch an interesting PSA. This is called Re Rewind the Future. Um, you may have seen this. It's relatively new. Alright, what do we got? Just came in. Heart attack. 5'9", 300 pounds, 32 years old. How the hell does that happen? <gasps> Can I get a, uh... Could be developing diabetes. You have to make a change. <clears throat> oh, yeah. You're graduating! <laughs> TV. You won't even have to leave. You can't do this. Yes, can I get a... Yeah, no, uh, deep dish. You have to make a change. Good job, Jim. You got an A+. Plus. Okay, so that was obviously supposed to be very striking and, um, maybe a little at times hard to watch um and there i will say are some things wrong with it um it's very mommy shamey oh it's it's so so shamey um at the end there because you know god forbid the mother does something so she has um some sanity right but I mean, let's put that into perspective. That's a small number of cases with obesity, okay? A small number of cases uh, with obesity. So there are a number of factors to consider when talking about how much somebody weighs um, uh, versus their age and their body size, right? Their frame. Uh, so let's go through these issues um nope i'm not gonna watch that again <laughs> all right overweight and obesity some definitions for you so overweight this is a medical definition so body weight exceeds the desirable weight for a person given the height age and body shape what i just said so overweight body weight exceeds that and you can see that there are no values associated with overweight, okay? And uh, I will talk about BMI, but I will also tell you how problematic BMI is, right? Um, obesity is characterized by being overweight and having an accumulation of uh, body fat, right? So this is specific tissue that we're talking about, specific substance in the body that we are talking about when it comes to obesity. It's not just that um, somebody is obese because they are overweight. That is not true. You can be overweight 
uh, by a significant margin, um, whatever metric you are, and not to be obese, okay? Because it has to do with this tissue here. This substance is what is regarded when we're talking about obesity, okay? Um, now, specifically focusing on the U.S. population and using um, the terms here with metrics, generally speaking, BMI is used. So again, this this two thirds figure does have some problems as far as as um, what we mean by overweight or obese. But a significant majority of the U.S. population, as of I believe 2017, this figure is from uh is overweight or obese now that's overweight or obese okay but then you can have individuals who are overweight and obese right so um much of this much of this is caused by calorie imbalance so consuming too many calories uh, than your body needs for active for the activity level. So we, I, I am gonna um, reiterate what um, BMR or basal metabolic rate is again for this class, but um, it's essentially you're consuming too many calories and consuming too many empty calories uh, than you are expending, and so that the, that energy stays with you. Okay, it gets converted into other things. So those empty calories, those sh those sugars, those high fructose corn syrup, corn syrups, and um, those other processed sugars are just being converted to um, different kinds of molecules, so you can store them later, and they end up getting um, stored in other tissues, and that that becomes an issue, right? Um, so this is the main source for uh, overweight and obese uh, situations here in the United States. Okay, um, among children and adolescents, it's three times as high as it was 30 years ago. Okay, you can see here overweight or obese as the uh, light blue line and the dark blue line are just obese individuals, and um, the percentage of children and adolescents does grow over time in both cases. It's almost a linear growth between the uh, four-year period, 1976 to 1980, and then ending in the two-year period of 2011-2012, right? So these are this is average uh, uh, overweight or obese. Um, and so the blue line, or excuse me, <laughs> the blue line, the light blue line here, uh, contains the percentage of the dark blue line. Okay, so these are are not additive in the way that you just look at them. So this is chunking out this right, and then so the rest of the percentage would just be overweight. Okay, and again, overweight does not tell you how well somebody is, how physically fit somebody is. Um, the fitness level of that person just saying overweight tells you nothing about the quality of life the person has, okay, and whether or not they are healthy, okay, so just because we're, we're showing these statistics and uh, does not mean that uh, this is a, a health crisis or a health issue on an individual level. Public health, it may be, but on an individual level, it may not be. Okay, so I just want to make that very clear, okay? All right, 17.5% uh, uh, in 2015 obese and 31.8% were obese. And this is from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, if you listen to NPR, you may hear this name quite frequently, RWJF. Um, they do a lot of scientific, uh, they do a lot of scientific um and philanthropic endeavors, and one of their main things is um, nutrition and obesity research. Okay. Um, now, yes, 17.5 obese and 31.8 among children and adolescents overweight or obese is quite a bit. Um, but among children and adolescents, there is a wide variety of gender and ethnic variations, and so... Um, a lot of it has to do with genes, 
uh, some some people are just bigger than others, and some ethnicities are bigger than others. Just culturally, we're talking hundreds of years and th- potentially thousands of years of of adaptation to various diets and various environments. Right. Uh, so, for example, the Inuit uh, people of North America. So we're talking far north, Canada, Alaska. Uh, the indigenous populations that live uh, up there, right? They, generally speaking, are more overweight than than um, white Americans or white North Americans in general because of what they eat, right? They eat a lot of whale blubber. They need that fatty tissue to insulate them in the harsh, what, Nine months out of the year, they have a they have a nice three months out of the year in the middle of the summer when like the sun doesn't go down, but the rest of the year it's freaking cold up there, and so they might be overweight by medical definitions. They might even be obese by medical definitions, but they are not because their culture and their genes have adapted to that environment and their their um food intake okay so keep all of this in mind as we go through this i know a lot of it is stark but um we're we're, you know there's shades of gray all the way through this okay um but simple physics simple physics does say that if somebody is heavier that um it's going to uh affect physical well-being right? More strain on joints and muscles and psychological well-being. There's a gigantic weight stigma in Western culture. I'm not even talking about the United States or just, or Canada. I'm just talking about Western culture in general. There's a gigantic weight stigma. Um, One of my grad school uh, friends, just that's all he researches is weight stigma. Okay. Uh, So yeah, weight is going to affect you. More weight is going to affect you more just in general, physically and psychologically. Um, And so here's body mass index. Here's where we start uh, with measuring uh, overweight and obese, uh, obesity, okay? Um, Again, body mass index and any weight stigma researcher will tell you that body mass index is an awful metric because it doesn't include any other factors other than weight and age, okay? There are ranges, yes, which according to people who like BMI will say the ranges are are accounting for all those other variations. But unfortunately, all of those ranges get lost when you assign somebody a number within BMI based on their weight and their age, okay? And so, yeah, it's a range to... Um, encapsulate all the individual differences but when you're telling somebody oh you know what you are you have a 31.5 bmi you are class one obese based on your age and weight that's very annoying is very annoying and two it's very demeaning on a psychological level because um you know somebody's calling you obese and you're like i don't feel obese I can't, don't get winded when I walk upstairs. I get winded when I walk upstairs and I am not obese. So it has to do with a, um, it has to do with, uh, with other factors. And so BMI is not a, a end all be all. And psychologically from a psychological yeah, exactly, uh, Katie. Yeah, exactly. It very, yeah, so I understand your sarcasm there. Um, from a psychological input, uh, it, it, it means really basically nothing because you get you two inputs and then nothing else, right? All right. Oh, shoot, where am I? Um, so obesity is linked to negative health outcomes. Uh, I don't want to beat around the bush here. There are negative health outcomes with significant amounts of um, body fat. OK, 
okay, adding to your physical weight, okay? So hypertension, we briefly mentioned uh, metabolic syndrome. Remember, it has to be all of those clusters of symptoms together to be classified as METs, okay? High blood pressure, I don't know why I have high blood pressure in there twice, great. So high blood pressure is just hypertension. <laughs> Uh, high cholesterol, right? So we're talking um, uh, high LDL and low HDL. We want H we want that HDL, that high density lipoproteins, and we don't want the low density uh, lipoproteins. Uh, breathing problems, okay. Depending on where the uh, uh, fat is stored around the body, this could put uh, significant strain on joints and um, uh, the internal visceral tissue of your abdomen and your thorax. And so that could lead to breathing problems as well as, um, as, well as uh, fitness problems. Fatty liver disease. So if your liver, liver starts to um, uh, get fat tissue growing on it, this impedes the ability of the liver to perform its functions of clearing out your bloodstream, um, detoxing your body, right? So all you need is a liver to do, a, to do a detox. You don't need a fancy drink to do a detox. Um, type 2 diabetes. So in the uh, PSA, uh, he, I, think the, I think the guy is having a heart attack, but I think what they're trying to imply is that he also has diabetes. I'm not entirely sure. It's a little bit shaky there. I think he's having a heart attack, though, and that's why he's in the um, emergency room. But type 2 diabetes, so this is adult onset diabetes. This is adults unable to produce enough insulin to manage sugar. And so if you eat too much sugar, this could lead to um, a diabetic seizure, a diabetic coma, and potentially death, right? And then in children... This could lead to enlarged uh, heart issues, so the heart gets too big and um, for the body cavity, and so blood pressure decreases because the heart is too big. It's not, it's not small enough to pump the blood effectively, so it's too big. It doesn't pump the blood effectively, so enlarged heart for children is rare, but um, can be a uh, situation. In chat, can you name any others um, uh, from your reading? Can you name any other uh, issues with obesity? Now, this is all correlational, but um, can you name any others? Shoo doop doo. Shoo doo. I don't have music on. I'm just making playing music in my head. Um, joint pain, yeah, for sure. Joint pain, uh, especially at the knees. At the knees. Okay. Joint pain. Has anybody uh, has anybody watched um, the TLC like shows? Yeah, sleep apnea, stroke, back problems for sure. Has anybody watched like the? Um, uh, TLC, like I'm 600 pounds and this is my life for some cancers for sure. Yeah. Um, the various, various, um, uh, levels. Um, what are some hazards when you are that obese? Death, yeah. So, are you an <laughs> are you answering my question of what happens when you're that obese? <clears throat> pregnancy compl complications, yeah, sure. For females, yeah, pregnancy complications. A lot of people on that show can't walk. Indeed, okay. So they're confined to some sort of bed or large seating area, right? Um, can't take care of themselves. In yep, can't take care of themselves. Um cushioned heart yes uh-huh uh stephanie yeah cushioned heart where fat cushions the heart yeah same sort of build up in the tissue on the heart um like it do, does with fatty liver it's it's much rarer than fatty livers though 
Yeah, limited movement, bed sores. Yes, yes. You're, you're all getting there. They can't do a lot of day-to-day. -day. Yeah, um, a lot of people on those shows, and I granted, I have not watched a ton of them, but a lot of people on those shows um, tend to just end up watching TV all day um, and, or playing video games, at least from what I can tell. I, I'm sure some people read and, and stuff, but um, yeah, uh, at... I mean, at, at extreme levels of obesity, the body essentially just begins to shut down because we don't actually have the physical structure to handle all of that weight. Yeah, Marissa, you're, you're exactly right. Other people end up having to take care of them um, and um, they have to bathe them and you end up with situations where um, the uh, the... What are the what's the word the that I want? Um, the circumstances are just right to create um, infections, uh, which could lead to things like sepsis. You know, your your, the, your blood is basically infected. My six hundred pound life. Somebody couldn't get out of bed with the team coming and help them. Yeah, yeah. I think I remember seeing that. I I. Th I I remember hearing or reading that um, um, one of those people I, that was featured on the show died recently. I, I could be wrong on that one. And it's, it's really interesting that we as humans have a, such, such a fascination with this stuff. Right, we have such a fascination with with watching extraordinary situations. Um, I'll, I'll throw in my strange addiction on that too. I have more to talk about with my strange addiction um, when we talk about addiction. So TBD on that one, um, or TBC, I should say, to be continued. So moving on, yeah. Um, anyways, gr great, great. Um, Great work, everyone, with um, talking about other effects there. So the first model that I want to talk about, I think, is the most important model because it's the least shamey of the obesity models. This is a genetic model, right? And it has to do with um, the an idea that we talked about when we we got when we were talking about stress, and that is your set point um, for homeostasis. Okay, and so your set point for weight. On a genetic level, a biological and genetic level, it's just higher than some other people, okay? Um, and twin studies bear this out. So if you look at a, an identical twin who is classified as overweight or obese by BMI, um, and then you look at their, their uh, identical twin, they're likely going to have a high correspondence of weight and BMI rating, Okay regardless of lifestyles. So um, it's actually fairly crucial to use these to use these twin studies to separate the heritability of weight. And weight is a, a decently heritable trait. There are things you can do to um, counteract counteract it. but if you are um, normally active and you feel healthy, and you're you're doing other things like nutrition, which we're going to get to in a little bit, uh, right? Then your BMI really means absolutely nothing, um, and and it could just match what you and your parents are, right? The and and so this fits with the weight set point model, okay? Um, and so people, and so the, the connection with the genetic model is that this is also a genetic thing. So if you have a higher weight set point for homeostasis, then you're more likely to gain weight faster than somebody who has a lower set point, okay, for, for weight. The positive incentive model, so this more speaks to um, the, uh, both, it's both a biological and social model, so it speaks to the PSA from the beginning of today's uh, material, and it's, it's sort of our need for high fat foods depending on especially depending on where you live where, where your culture or your ancestors 
grew, right? So Inuit versus um, the people of the Amazon, um, right? Two way wildly different environments um, have wildly different evolutionary trajectories on the need for fatty food in diets. We still need that fat. It you know it helps us create our brains. It helps us. Um, a diet it helps with our digestion it helps you know insulate us you know fat is good okay but the social part of this is that we line all of our foods with fat okay so the big deal with you know fast food restaurants in the 80s and 90s and and early 2000s was that the vegetable or the oil that they were using was not as healthy and so it was very good. Oh, it was, it was very good. Having being a person who worked at McDonald's before Super Size Me came out, oh, it was so delicious. But it was very bad. It was um, I, if you ate a lot of it, high cholesterol, um, high triglycerides, that sort of thing. But it's so good, and it and it just makes us want to. Um, eat more of it because it activates our dopamine tract um logan not all of super size me was was bs not all of it um quite a bit of it was right uh, as somebody who has worked in fast food and worked in fast food shortly before the movie came out yeah it, it morgan spurlock is um he does cut things out uh, i will say yeah but um, no, Super Size Me is definitely, maybe the effects on his body were a little exaggerated, but not the facts that he said about McDonald's. Uh, oh, and then our last, our last model is, of course, the, the um, uh, piece de resistance of obesity models is the biopsychosocial model, or BPS, right? So heredity. So genes, of course, that's the biological point. 50%. I said it's fairly good uh, correspondence uh, between um, parents and offspring. Okay. Um, but then, of course, we do have different factors that contribute. Okay. So adopted children do correlate more strongly with the weights of biological parents than their adoptive parents. So this along with twin studies does give a give significant significant credence to the idea that heredity is uh, and genes are most influential with respect to uh, on a on a all being all things being equal basis um, the body weights adopted siblings so if you have um, if you have this is least common, I would say. But if you have two siblings who are not biologically related and neither of them are biologically related to their parents. So um, a few of the siblings from, you know, uh, Brangelina's days where, you know, they, they adopted like Max um, and then some and then Zahara or what, the, the one from Mali. Uh, <laughs> um those siblings, right? The one from like the the East Asian, I think is Max, right? Somebody, somebody find out for me. And then the um, one that Angelina adopted from from Molly, right? Uh, we're talking about those things. They're not related to Brad and Angelina, and they're not related to each other. And so, if you you know put them together, they're not going to have um, high high correspondence with their their body weights okay um your genes also reflect how much cholesterol that you can handle whether it's hdl or ldl okay the psychosocial factors of the model are also pretty crucial so friendship with um an obese person tends to increase the risk of being obese uh oneself or odds you can say um comfort food and stress eating which we're pretty much doing all all of us are doing right now um, right? Stress eating. Um, even if we weren't in a, uh, even if we weren't in a global pandemic, I would say that stress eating tends to occur regardless. 
Okay. I do it too. Yeah. I have a I went to Costco on Saturday and I bought a giant jar of peanut M&Ms. Should I have gotten it? It was ten dollars. Eleven dollars? Should I have gotten it? Probably not. Do I feel bad about it? Nope. Do I love peanut M&Ms? You bet your sweet bippy I do. So, you know, stress eating, right? Uh, a lot of, lot over the holidays, especially if if you if your family doesn't get along. There's a lot of stress eating. There's a lot of good desserts to eat over the holidays, like Thanksgiving and, and Christmas, right? Um, stress eating, even even um, when you achieve something great, you're like, yeah, eat all the cake, ah, right? And then um, any social occasion where it's just like. Any, anything. We, we do a lot of stress eating is what I'm saying. And most of that is of high sugar foods or processed sugar foods. Um, high fructose corn syrup. Uh, because we have just way too much corn in the United States. Uh, because there are so many subsidies for corn. And you should know that if you grew up in Illinois. You might know somebody who just gets paid by the government to just make as much corn as possible. I wonder how that's going to... I don't know if I'm going to miss seeing all the cornrows um, lining 24 going into school. We'll see. Um, yeah. So, stress eating, of course. So, that's psychosocial, of course. Uh, restraint theory uh, has to do with stress eating in the absence of hunger. Okay? And not having the restraint to not to do that and do other coping mechanisms, right? So coping mechanism doesn't involve eating. Um, I will also apply restraint theory here to a common thing that's happening upstairs with my kids is that, and I think I meant, we, we may have mentioned this in class before, either this class or in sensation and perception, um, eating because uh, we're bored. So that has, that does not, comfort food or stress eating it's not having the restraint to then focus our attention on other things so we just eat because you know it's going to pass the time but of course a lot of boredom eating is not based on hunger okay it's not based on hunger so we end up just eating and that tends to be unhealthy foods foods in, you know, saturated fats and um, other snacks, right? And unhealthy snacks. Eat a, eat a, eat a, eat an apple as opposed to um, sugar puff cereal or whatever, um, whatever it is that, uh, I don't know, what che cheesy poofs, cheesy poof crackers is what uh, True and, and Bartleby eat because they're uh, fictitious. Um, and so comfort food, stress eating, and restraint theory go then into a habitual pattern, right? So we create habits, and not only does this increase obesity risk, but it also increases other risks associated with it. So if you're, if you are stress eating sugar all the time, then this could lead to increased risk for diabetes. You may not actually be obese, but you could have diabetes, okay? Um, and so unhealthy food consumption is a big problem, right? And then moving on to um, the social factors here. So obesity tends to be more prevalent among minority groups. So black Americans, Native Americans, and Latinx Americans. So um, uh, it... it there are a number of factors with this, but minority groups tend to be um, uh, lower socioeconomic status, and so this plays a role because lower socioeconomic status leads to things like food deserts, um, not having a grocery store within a given radius. So Peoria, there's a neighborhood south of me, um, a large neighborhood south of me, where Kroger used to be. Uh, it's they, they Kroger moved out of it. Um, and so that, that particular area is now a food desert, right? Um, so food deserts, which then leads to eating more fast food. More fast food means 
um, higher um, overweight and obesity levels, okay? Uh, but also, generally speaking, this is cultural. Oh my goodness. Oh no. I lost, no. I ran at my my noise canceling headphones died. Oh no! I mean I can still hear, but oh bummer. Uh, and so this leads. Oh, so I got a lot of feedback in my ears. Great. Um. So what was I saying? Oh yeah, fast food, which is unhealthier and, and uh, that sort of thing. Um. Bad for you. Food tends to be more. Um. Uh, tends to be cheaper. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. All right. Yes. Food deserts, poverty income ratio. I'm going to move along. Yeah. So central Peoria was the area that I was talking about. Um, so treatment and prevention, dieting, of course. Okay. Um, but of course we do have fat prejudice and um, weight stigma. Oof. People tend to diet because of those psychological uh, inputs. Uh, so the weight stigma and the anti-fat prejudice. Uh, and then the 10, if you diet well, if you diet well, okay, then um, that is considered successful if you reduce your weight by 10%. Okay, so if you are 200 pounds, then you need to reduce your weight by 20 pounds right to get to 180 and you have to maintain that 180 for a year okay um and uh just broadly if you survey adults more than half would like to lose weight um but only uh but only about a quarter are seriously trying and even less than that from 12 to 19 are actively trying 12 to 19 years old okay um, I realize that we are running low on time here, and I haven't even gotten nutrition, okay? But diets fail. People tend to not to do a very good job of estimating their calorie needs. I'm going to take these off. Uh, so one of the ways that we aren't very good at estimating our caloric intake is we don't know what our BMR is, our basal metabolic rate, and so we don't know how to then modify the caloric intake based on that number. You'd be going too high, you could be going too low, um, and so you really need to calculate that first, which is the base level of calories you need, kilocalories that you need, in order for your base metabolic function to occur at rest. Okay, and so you need to modify your um, caloric intake based on that number as opposed to just or any kind of fitness website or, or um, fitness program because it's not really going to give you what you need. And then some diets don't work for people based on that because they're not getting the right calories from the right sources, which we'll talk about when we get to nutrition. Dieters tend to underestimate consumption. Okay, um, and so and and if you have if you use a caloric tracker like MyFitnessPal or something like that, it's really hard to get caloric information from things that don't have it on the box. So like nutrition facts, yeah, okay. If you eat one hundred percent boxed and packaged food that has nutrition facts on it, this might not be a big deal because you can um, you can accurately gauge your cal caloric uh, consumption. But if you eat like a piece of meat or a serving of veggies, how much how many calories is that actually? So um, that's a and it's a really important question because you might actually not be getting that the correct information from my fitness pal. And they have a lot of or other um, calorie trackers, and they have a lot of, of stuff in their database for how much calories, um, you know, a, a pound of, of beef is, but do you have, you know, do you have a kitchen scale to weigh whether or not you're eating a pound of beef? Also, don't eat a pound of beef in one sitting. Uh, it just sounds awful. Um, so, you know, that's, that's important too. Um, 
struggle with compliance, right? And we have these things like cheat days and, and that, and one cheat day a week turns into two cheat days a week. Two cheat days a week turns into four cheat days, days a week, and then the diet just crumbles, right? Um, and then unrealistic expectations has to do with like, okay, I'm gonna lose 20 pounds in two months. That's 10 pounds a month? No. Unless you're dieting and exercising, that's not going to happen, okay? You really need to uh, manage your expectations and be like, okay, two pounds a week, I can do that. I can, you know, I can I can do these smaller chunks um, as I go through this diet, right? So this is dieting without exercising. This is just dieting. Um, and if you do a fad diet like paleo or Atkins or something like that. Most of these have a plan for while you're on the diet, but either you stay on that plan and you never change your diet, or there's no information for you whatsoever on how to then eat everything once you're off the diet. So if you're paleo for a little while, okay, to lose, the, to lose some weight, um, do you just stay paleo forever? Or do you go back to eating other things that aren't paleo and what's the plan for that? How do you reintroduce those foods, right? Um, and Mich during the Obama administration, one of Michelle Obama's um, major things, her, one of her major campaigns was the Let's Move campaign. You actually might be familiar with this because you, um, you were in high school at least or maybe even elementary school while the Obama administration was in um, in the White House. And so I may have actually done some of this. Um, and it's, br it's a brilliant campaign, and it's too bad that it's like it was only her campaign as opposed to like something from the Department of Health and Human Services, which would carry, th you know, may carry through from administration to administration, is basically hers and whether or not schools continue it after now that she's not um, first lady. It depends, um, but it, it, it was a truly biopsychosocial um, effort on her part, and it was massive, massive. And so you may have seen, like, her her gardens and that sort of thing. So that was nutrition and, like, eating and, and like, being able to sustain yourself with, you know, planting small fruit and veggie gardens at your house, getting nutrition and, and exercise information to parents, okay? Um, part of it... Uh, and, in addition to the Obama administration, was to improve the food quality that are given in breakfast and, and lunches um, on a federal level. So then school districts adopted those standards, and I believe they are still using those standards, although I, the Trump administration and Betsy DeVos wants to loosen those so uh, or have loosened them recently. I think that's come into play recently. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're at a, a situation where, you know, if you are in school, if a kid is in school between transfers of administrations, you don't get the same amount of, um, quality depending on who's doing what. Okay. All right. I think we're gonna, we're gonna round this out, um, by doing this nutrition activity. Um, and so what I want you to do is for each of these, and I, I don't, don't ask me why I made this a table that's all orange and stuff. It just is. And what you're doing is you are answering true or false if this represents your eating behavior. Okay. Um, so I have two slides of questions. So I believe there's like 15 questions. So you're just, you're just answering based on yourself and, um, whether or not you do this, so true or false. And then I believe I have some scoring on the next one. I, I don't remember, actually. Um, so you let me know. You, you let me know. You do this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm running a little bit behind on material. I think we're supposed to do addiction on on Wednesday, but I need to finish exercise and nutrition on Wednesday. Hmm. 
I don't, I don't know. I have to condense cannabis a little bit, which makes me real sad, but that's all right. Um, so let me know when I can. Um, I'm gonna go on to this the next page. So if you haven't done the first one, then I'll go back. But I need to. Um, oh yeah. So to give your get yourself a score. Oh, it's out of eighteen. My bad. Um, to give yourself a score, um, just add up all of your trues. Make your trues one. And your your false is zero, and then you should have a score from zero to eighteen. Um, I have I have some scales for you, some scales, some ranges. Sorry, some ranges. Um, let me know in chat if I need to go back to the first page. And while you're doing that, I'll go ahead and and let you know. So the um, author of this survey has has indicated that um, 14 or more trues, so if you have a score of 14 or higher, 14, 15, 16, 17, or 18, that indicates a pattern that is healthier than most Americans. Okay, so you are on the, the it's a higher level, right? Um, better than, healthier than average. Um, scores between 18, or geez, scores between eight and 13, Indicate you're caught in the great American middle. Not too bad, not exactly great. If nothing else, try to bypass some of the artery-damaging animal fat. Choose skim milk, veggie pizzas, and turkey sandwiches. Okay. Um, here's the first page again. I'll come back to the last bit of that. Okay. <laughs> Reach out and touch. Oh, look at that. Hi, Or. How are you? Nee, 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 nee. Tickle, tickle, tickle. Sorry. Uh, true is one and false is zero. Yep. You add up all your trues. It's true. 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 I wish for me and for you. Hero. Hero. You, If you were in learning last semester, you know what I'm talking about. It's true. True. True, true. All right. Um, and then uh, students who have seven or fewer in need of a major dietary overhaul. I probably have seven or fewer. I'm probably right there with you. I also don't like veggies, Logan. I don't. Um, Seven or fewer. Ooh. Okay. Load up in chat what you got. <laughs> Let's see how bad we all are. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. We are. scared me uh four squad yeah two big oof yeah sorry katie Jaden, eight not bad not bad maybe uh eat a veggie pizza i don't know <laughs> uh what did you what did you get peyton you didn't put your number in. <laughs> 13 great great taylor that's good Okay. Veggie pizza tastes bad. It does. It does. Especially if there are mushrooms on it. Blech. 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 All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. 10, not bad. All right. Okay, it's not not terrible, Peyton. You know, 5 isn't terrible. Um this, you know, somebody got 2. Who somebody got a 2? Uh Caitlin 11, not bad. Not bad. All right. All right. So class is over, y'all. We are going to um, pick back up with nutrition and exercise before we jump into addiction on Wednesday. Um, and so do, if that means that um, addiction is pushed off 
well, and then we'll push it back. And so that might mean that other classes this week and next week are pushed back. So we'll 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 play that by ear. Not to worry though. Um, I will see some of you at two. Otherwise, until tomorrow or Wednesday. Bye.